Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm really excited about this one. I follow this uh, company on social media. I've been, I've been really interested about teachers and things of that nature of what they're doing. So uh, before we get into all that, today we are welcome Christina Bellman. Christina, how are we doing? Hi, I'm great today. Thank you. So, Christina, before we get into the company, give us a little background. Uh, tell us, please introduce yourself, some of your personal experience, and what led you down this entrepreneurial path? Sure. Um, I'm Chrissy, and uh, I live in Boulder, Colorado. And I started on this path in 2011 or 12 when I still had a corporate job. Um, I was sort of teased by the idea of entrepreneurship and had friends when I was getting out of business school that were willing to make the jump straight out of school. And I was not quite there yet. Uh, I felt the tease and I really wanted to. I was conflicted, but ultimately I wanted to establish my independence and build up my resume and go get some experience. That's what I did in front office investment banking and management consulting. But a couple years into it, I had the idea for what is now Levo, like basically the invention. So I was tinkering in my uh, nights and weekends, like moonlight hours with prototypes and hiring students to help me and things like that. And eventually reached a fork in the road where I had to make a decision and I did, and that was 2016. So now it's been quite a while where I, uh, I like to say I joined the circus at that time. Like it was a crazy decision and it's been uh, wild in the best ways um, ever since. So you mentioned Levo. Tell, tell us about your current venture or in business and what inspired you to pursue this particular entrepreneurial endeavor? Sure. Um, so Levo is a hardware company, a hardware startup where we're um, oriented around this uh, physical product that is a kitchen appliance that infuses oils. So um, if you've ever known anyone who's into things like essential oils or um, gourmet cooking in general, or even like making at home, like medicinal or holistic remedies for themselves, Levo appeals to those um, consumers. It allows you to infuse herbs into pretty much anything like oil, honey, butter, vegetable glycerin, beeswax, you name it, um, as easy as making coffee. Um, so it's very similar. If you were standing in front of one, you'd feel like you're in front of a uh, like a different type of coffee machine. It's a very similar um, user experience, um, but it takes what's normally, all those DIY applications that I just listed are usually very, very messy um, and involve a lot of hand washing and smell and filtering out and all these things. And basically Levo just makes it automated. So it's kind of like a set it and forget it um, solution for those things um, and lets people get more creative. So it takes the mess out of it, lets you replicate them more easily because it has very precise time and temperature controls. So if you want to make the same thing over and over again, instead of it kind of being guessing, like when you're on your stovetop or something, uh, you can get really exact about it. Um, so that's what Levo is. We've built it out. Uh, it started with, you know, we were a one item business for a long time. And today we have, I actually don't even know off the top of my head how many items are in the catalog, but we've got three different versions of the machine, a whole suite of accessories, um, consumable mixes that make it easy to, uh, make things with the machine. Um, and we're generally in a phase of our development where we're listening to customers and just sort of seeing what they want and making it basically. And really with this machine, you you can pretty much infuse anything. So I think back folks, if you're, if you've gone to a cocktail bar recently in the last five years, you always seem to see like this infused liquor, infused vodka and you fuse something, right? However, there's a lot of different things you can kind of infuse. Can you kind of like rattle off a few different things you can use this machine for? Yeah. And that was sort of this concept that we're talking about right now about the multitude of use cases for oil infusion was sort of the genesis of the idea. Um, I, it was sort of like, what could I make that would address? I wasn't necessarily the customer myself, but I wanted to make something for people who were into this sort of thing. Uh, because I found that they were online, very active in forums, very active on YouTube, um, but there were no companies or brands that were really um, involved. It was just this conversation happening online um, among uh, consumers making these things DIY, basically. So I thought that would be a cool brand to make. Um, but you could make like a spicy chili honey. Uh, you could infuse an olive oil and use the same one in a cooking recipe and then also turn it into like a body scrub. 
Um, if you wanted to, you can make homemade lip balm and salves. You could make, you mentioned tinctures, MCT oil on our website is um, one of the most popular uh, carrier oils that we sell. And a lot of people use it for making um, something like a tincture. You could even make things for your pets. Um, so yeah, it really, it really does run the gamut. I think in the early days of Leva, one of the first recipes that really blew me away was a turmeric ice cream. Um, I was like, yeah, I just remember like the picture is burnt in my mind as this like gorgeous orange ice cream where someone had infused the cream with, uh, Levo and then made that ice cream. So, um, I see things all the time that I never even realized you could make with Levo. Um, and we have a kind of a community oriented brand. So we have like a private Facebook group where that's one of the really active places where you just see tons of people getting very creative. So it's really a plot. I think of it more as like a platform for other people's creativity, um, because they have far exceeded what I even realized you could make with it. <laughs> that is really cool. Cause you, you are kind of encouraging entrepreneurial endeavors, but from the kitchen perspective, right. And, or not even from kitchen perspective, but just from like a, a product design, like create, create a new uh, like, you know, I was talking to my wife the other day. How can I, I keep buying different hair products that make my hair dry? I'm like, man, I think I'm just going <laughs> to get to this point where I'm just going to make my own, right? But <laughs> like mixing and matching all these different ingredients to see what works is also important. And then you're essentially giving them a tool to allow them to do that at home. Yeah, yeah. I, I like to think of it that way too. You basically like make it like a chemistry set. <laughs> which is really cool now for folks in the Oregon area and in fact Colorado as well yes it does infuse those gummies as well you crazy folks so again I really <laughs> recommend checking it out the the website has a lot of different uh variable uh things uh, different things that they're able to do now let's let's take a step back can let's take a step back to the beginning of this entrepreneurial journey so you mentioned you're in the corporate setting you went to business school and then you decided to pivot what was that moment that that finally decided, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and jump off the deep end. And I'm going to, as you, as you put it, I'm going to join the circus. <laughs> um, so I, I think it was sort of like, you have to have the nerve to leave what you're doing. And that has to intersect with your excitement around what you're about to go do. It has to be a to and a from energy, you know? Um, so I'd say I, I have one night, my from what I wanted to leave and go from was, uh, I was in investment banking and I had a moment where I was thinking about the next several years ahead of me and what, what is my job for the next several years. And I realized it was uh, transferring information from PDF to Excel <laughs> and like, you know, as fancy as my job felt <laughs> and, uh, and as much as uh, I had learned in school, that was my reality for the next several years. And that was really hard uh, for me. That realization really stuck with me. Um, and then at the same time, I, originally had a dream that I was going to be able to side hustle Levo, which is now, now that term is so much more popular than it was almost 10 years ago. Um, but at the time I thought, oh, I can totally do that. I'm just going to make this thing and sort of sell it on the side, you know, like a side business. And um, when I was, when I started to realize that's not how this goes, you need way more time and energy. I was going to have to travel abroad and go like learn about manufacturing, all these things that are not happening on nights and weekends. Um, I, uh, had to fall, I had to ask myself, am I in love with it enough to do it? And that I gave myself, when I realized that I couldn't just do it on the side, I had about, about nine months later was when I quit my job. So I sat on it. I, um, I even went as far as making fake business cards and going to events, uh, like using meetup.com. I was going to entrepreneurial events with fake business cards just to try it on when I still had my corporate job and just see how it felt, see how people reacted to my idea. And I just needed that little bit of validation and to, to imagine myself doing it before I was brave enough. Um, you know, I like to talk to a lot of other entrepreneurs about like how massive of a financial consideration it is for someone to take on this risk. Um, you know, not everybody has like a fallback plan. Um, and that was myself, my, uh, that was the case for me. So I, I took it uh, with a lot of consideration. And I'd say I had that that final nine month lap was when I really put it all together, but it was hard. It was a really hard time. You know, I, I love that story because I think it tells the audience, you know, this is something I, I teach about when I talk about like overcoming imposter syndrome, you know, fake it till you, mm -hmm. make it. I, I don't, what I don't mean is, is fake it till you make it to the, like, don't be out there just spilling nonsense thinking, you know, it, I mean, fake it till you make it 
create a business card, attend a conference, attend a trade show, try to learn about that expertise. They don't know whether you're in the industry or not. You can say you're in an industry, but don't go out there and spewing unfactual information about the industry. <laughs> go there and like learn, absorb, become a sponge, right? Take that opportunity to really learn and network because, you know, I would, yeah, I would love to ask you what, how, how, uh, how beneficial has networking been to you in your career growth? Um, it's incredible. I'd say recently I'm, I'm doing more of it again. Uh, cause it's really now that I'm six plus years into this business, I, I can kind of look back and be like, there've been periods of time when I'm just really in the weeds and working on the business and other periods of time where I'm maybe out in the world talking more where you're, the more you talk about it, the more help you can receive. Um, and, uh, and also making time to think strategically because once the business, you know, it's kind of in the, in the early days, you can just pontificate about how it's going to be. And you can imagine it, you can build up all these fantasies. You can have all these ideas. You can also spend time being really strategic and perfecting a strategy. And then once you're into it and you're executing, now you're receiving like an onslaught of work that you have to react to. Um, and it can be a little hard to see the forest through the trees at that point. So I'd say, you know, it's been, in, it's been absolutely invaluable to me. And in the beginning, it was the only thing I had to, to like, I had to network my way to solutions, like go find the resources I needed. Um, and then I'd say the challenge with networking now is just time management um, and making time for it and making it a priority when you have so many other things going on, because it is a fast track to getting a lot of help. There are so many people out there with so much experience and, um, you do need to find your own way. I've definitely gone down a couple, uh, I'll call them cul-de-sacs where I take advice. I've taken advice extremely literally from a place of self, uh, maybe being insecure or thinking that I need somebody's exact advice or I have to do it exactly the way they did it. And I've, I've realized it's really a hybrid. It's like, go get great advice, get great support, but then it has to, your business is so unique you have to make it your own um, and you, cause no one's holding the bag besides you at the end of the day. Um, so I'd say it's a balance, but it's an amazing thing to do. And people have been, one of my favorite things about doing this is just meeting amazing people, amazing people doing amazing things, willing to help you. I, I've just experienced like so much goodwill, honestly, along this journey. You know, and I love that you said that too, because I think that's important for the audience to understand is you know, when you're building your brand, right, you're building your brand, uh, you have a, your, you have your brand guidelines, you have your outline of what you brand wants to stand for. Now, when you go get advice from other entrepreneurs, they have their brand guideline, the way they wanted to create their brand. So they're, you know, a minimal viable product for their brand, for their market, even though it might be a similar industry, might be a completely different target audience, you know? And so understanding that is also important, uh, getting your idea out there. And just to your point, you know, getting getting a little bit of insight, uh, but not taking it literal is, is really a good, a good advice to give. Uh, but in addition to that, you know, folks, don't be afraid to share your idea with others. Um, I think the people always fear that oh, they're going to steal my idea. They're going to steal my idea. Trust me, if they had your idea, they wanted to do it, they would have already done it. It costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. And like you mentioned, you have to have the passion for it uh, because there are a lot of long nights, early mornings, uh, and when you're kind of by yourself doing it. And so, you know, feel free to share your ideas. Cause again, I think uh, one of the things that, there's a stigma throughout our country in general is just talking about mental health and how we're doing as an individual. And I got to tell you, folks, I've been I've been talking to a counselor recently, and I feel so much better about it. I feel better about myself. I feel things are, you know, starting to go in the right direction. I'm really powering through things. But at the same time, uh, it took me to talk about that to realize that I actually needed help. And so, you know, <laughs> going out there and, and feeling comfortable, I'm not saying you go out there and spew your emotionals out to anybody, but I am saying go out there and share your your entrepreneurial ideas with others, network, uh, because there is a support group out there that wants to see you succeed, especially in the business community. There's a lot of founders, venture capitalists, angels, investors, they want to see you succeed as well. Uh, because again, then you'll, you're actually supporting the community. Now, you know, Christina, you, you've, you've done, you've done this for some time now. What are what are some of the most things, you know, you've, one of the best things maybe you've learned through this process that you glad you went through that experience? Um, I have to think for a second on the best thing that I've learned, but I would say uh, in general, learning things the hard way, it's not fun, but you also never forget those lessons. So 
so there's been a few things where I even had some mentorship or some advice of don't do that or we're worried about that or something and I went and was hard-headed and learned it the hard way and I you know I wouldn't even say I regret it because it is so ingrained in me what that lesson was at this point that I learned it really hard so I wouldn't even be afraid to make really big mistakes like sometimes you have to go to the end of your rope something in you needs to go learn it that way so um I, I've definitely learned some things the hard way um I would say what we were just what you were just touching on and what, what we're kind of talking about here is probably one of my biggest lessons that you need to consult other people and respect expertise and acknowledge that if you're just getting started you definitely don't have all the answers and there's plenty of there's so much to glean from other people but at the same time when you're running your own business it is unique to you and something you created and something only you can be responsible for so it has to resonate in your gut so a lot of people talk about like it's got to you know to follow your gut follow your gut i would say you know it's a hybrid of go get advice and go hear what other people do because if you were just in your own um, you know, if you weren't getting any of that information, you're probably not um, at the, you know, where you need to be. You could probably be getting farther, getting some advice. But at the end of the day, you got to take that, you have to sleep on it, and you have to wake up and say, what's the version of that advice that really resonates with me? Because it really does come down to even things, um, you know, like personal values. If, if, you, if you're getting advice that's kind of stressing, like, you know, I actually don't feel that comfortable treating that person that way or striking a deal like that. Something doesn't sit right with me, but I know that person's an expert. Don't do it yet. You're not comfortable with it. You can't own it. You have to be willing to be like, you know what, I'm, I think this is the best decision I could make with the information I have right now. I feel as good as I possibly can about it. And then you could put your whole self into it and do it. But if you've got like one foot out the door, your stomach is churning or anything like that, then um no amount of expert advice is going to help you because you need that energy and you need that like alignment to get yourself through the tremendous amount of work and stress that your business will inevitably uh put you through this is this is so true and you know folks this is i do a lot of pitch coaching for and uh you mm -hmm. know entrepreneurs that are going to be doing uh pitching in front of venture capitalists and community and the one of the first things i tell them when they start their pitch is talk about them. What is their story and how it relates to what they're doing from a business? For you know, you, we all found a problem, we have a solution. But first, what I want to hear about is why are you the leader of this business, the one leading the charge and creating this new innovative idea? And usually, it's something within your background that had you know this life changing moment, or I had this experience. You know, you, you think of Starbucks and Howard Swartz. He talks about you know I went to Europe. He had this experience in Europe and he wanted to feel that experience here in the United States. And so that's why he created Starbucks, you know, and you, you so you start to see, uh, you know, but it's your, your story, your personal story, that's more translucent than anything, because at the end of the day, venture capitalists, you know, if you, if you want to go that route, if that is your desire, desire, uh, those individuals, their, their goal is, is to kind of, you know, purchase you up and, and sell, but they're not buying you they're they're actually investing in you as an entrepreneur but they're truly buying the operations right but it's like you as the entrepreneur you got to sell the story to get even in, you have to sell your story just to even get the door open right to have an opportunity to present yourself so again you know uh i i really do admire what you were doing and how you're doing it and networking and, and telling your story the importance of it um now with that said can you share some of the significant hurdles, some of the challenges that you've had starting your own business? <laughs> uh, it's a long, long, long list. Um, you know, even, you know, impacting your personal life. You're going to stretch relationships and people around you um, are going to have to, you need support around you. Um, you're not going to be able to, what, there's going to be days where your business has to replace you know, taking care of someone else, like it's going to have to be prioritized at some point. Um, so that's, that's really hard. That's hard for anybody. And so there's sacrifices that have to be made. And, um, you know, no one is super person <laughs> to be able to balance all that. So I'd say that's ge a general challenge and a general challenge that follows me um, throughout it. Um, a specific and more acute one that happened with Levo was um, we were, you know, when I first started making the product, I had to go through, you know, my phases of getting connected to better and better manufacturers. Um, and I had an amazing experience. I've, I ultimately basically have like familial relationships with who I work with now, and they've been like very transformative for me. Um, but in the very, in the very beginning, 
um, we had some issues and, in, and once I realized, you know, this partner that I'm working with is just not going to get it done. They're not, there's still going to be a quality issue. Like there was a specific quality issue and they're not going to be able to fix it. And a mentor um, helped uh, me and the team literally make our own assembly line in Colorado. And we rented a giant warehouse and we made like thousands of Levos ourselves um, by hand. Uh, we hired um, some extra workers. We had line cards. We did our own QC. Um, and it took us like two and a half months to make what we needed to make at that time. And the day that we packed them all in the trailer, actually, I was like covered in bruises because I, it was so cathartic for me to like lift up each box and bring it into the uh, tractor trailer um, that I was just like rushing through it. And it was like, it was such an emotional, like crazy time. Um, but it was, a, it was an amazing day. Like the day we packed the trailer, we got pizza. We had like our, my mentors, our team, our neighbors, just like friends of ours came and helped pack it. So it's like, it was so stressful and so crazy, but also one of my favorite memories of Lebo. And that's kind of how this works. Like, you know, you have these traumatizing events and then you can kind of talk about them and laugh and the laughter is a little cathartic. Like it was very traumatizing, but it was, uh, but it was awesome um, at the same time. So, you yeah. know, I, I would love to hear your venture down that product market kind of stages, right? You kind of go from ideation to development, to product design, to product development, and then to, to you know, to see if it, do you actually have them to create your minimal viable product? And then you see if you actually have a product market fit. So tell us about your journey. How did you start that building process? What was it kind of your first steps? And then what did you do once you started? To, okay, I have the idea. Now I want to develop it. Yeah, um, I would say I was shooting from the hip on this one, um, I would highly recommend that a lot of people um, put in the time and energy to do as much research as they possibly can and really think hard about how big of a market you're getting into. The more small and niche and particular your market is, um, the harder it's gonna be to reach that person. You have to, and if you are gonna do that, you have to feel very confident in your marketing ability because making the thing is one, is, is the first challenge and it's a huge challenge, but at the end of the day, you're gonna have to become a marketer and that's going to be your job for years and years following. So I would think very critically about that. So I was going off mostly intuition on that front. Um, and I had my reasons why, and I um, knock on wood got lucky, I would say um, at, at where we landed and, and that it fell into the hearts of a lot of consumers. Um, as far as making the physical product goes, um, I started by walking around. I kind of had a visual in my mind for what it, what it was. Um, and I had a lot of assumptions about what would be easy. And I hired some engineering students in New York. I was living in New York City at the time. Um, and they did some fabulous work. These are just college students that I hired that were really hungry for a project. And they basically ended up making a Levi. I remember the night I went and drove to pick up the first like functioning prototype that they had made. And it was like completely not what I wanted. Um, but their process and the thinking and the critical thinking that went into how they arrived there really contributed to the patents that we have and accelerated making the wrong thing accelerated how much faster we got to the to the right thing actually in retrospect so that was huge um and then also i spent a ton of time just in restaurant supply stores i just got to know every appliance and tried to i would stand there in the store restaurant supply stores are a little looser than like a williams sonoma where there's a lot of stuff on on shelves so i was able to you know take the lid off look inside try to understand what's going on with anything that had a heater, a dispenser, um, dual voltage. Like I was just trying to wrap my head, at, like what are all the certifications on the back? Like really just spending a lot of time in that. And then I narrowed down a couple appliances that seemed to have any kind of similarity that I wanted to like mush together to make a Levo basically. Um, and I bought them all and we were hacking them. So we sort of had like, you know, a functioning prototype that was custom. And then we sort of had these working prototypes that were like Frankenstein versions of existing machines, like rip out the insides and replace it with, at one point we had like a can that had like holes poked in it as like the center chamber where you put all the herbs in it and stuff. So like we were really uh, fashioning things by hand. Um, and then, yeah, then I started actually working closer with, and I highly recommend this um, for other entrepreneurs is um, try to get to the source. like try to get as far as you can with MacGyvering in that way. 
and then really think about who's going to ultimately make this and the sooner you can engage those people and get feedback from those people you can avoid like this whole world of product design middlemen for lack of a better term that if you're self-funding your own business or trying to be really scrappy are going to be incredibly expensive um so some of the resources for that you know were not available to me but would be to a larger company would be these like amazing product design firms that do all this but i just realized very quickly there was no way I was that was going to be sustainable for me. So I got lucky, start working with manufacturers really early um, and kind of going back and forth uh, with them and getting feedback. So, yeah, that was the process. Um, and, and at the end of the day, the person who's making it has to care. Like they're not going to make high quality things if they don't care and like really understand what you're trying to do. Um, and you're going to need a ton of help. And there's a ton of expertise out there. Um, so. Yeah, and I like your idea about you know connecting with the supplier early. Uh, yeah, building those relationships, folks, as entrepreneur are in like they are invaluable uh, because the, I think during the pandemic, one thing I learned throughout a lot of my interviews is the those relationships with suppliers were leveraged more during the pandemic than any other time because of you know you know, a lot of things that were going on operationally. And so building those relationships with your suppliers and vendors is a really big advantage for you as an entrepreneur. And one of the things you also were mentioned was building the brand. You know, I would love to learn, you've got the product out, you went through the product development phase. Now you have a viable product, you're now bringing it out. How do you brand? Because you mentioned you don't want to go too narrow on your niche. So how do you brand? Who, what, who was the typical client for Levo? And then how do you brand to them? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's, you know, brands are like a lot of people are like, you know, ju it's just the lo like start with a logo and then, and it's true. You do kind of start with some of these like basic assets and start to try to create a look and feel that you think works. Um, you know, in the beginning, we tried to appeal to everybody and I've had to learn along the way that you've got to pick your battles about when you try to have mass appeal and when you accept that your niche and like they have a very specific thing they want to here. So in the beginning, we picked like we launched with black, copper and stainless steel, like three very what we thought were really neutral colors. We weren't going to take a risk on like a pink unit or something like that. Um, so we, you know, we tried to be pretty in the middle. Um, we uh, did like a lot of press, a lot of earned media in the beginning. That was sort of our like go to market strategy um, and then see who responds. Um, about a year into the business was when we created the Levo Love Club, which I think has been one of the most valuable assets to us um, and, and ways to talk to your consumer because customer service, like you talk to people, but usually if they're mad that their shipment got delayed or they can't find their manual or something like that to really get like a proactive insight and to watch people like see what they're sharing on social media um, and see what they're talking about inside a community and and just be in service to them. So that's really how the brand has developed since we created this community, which I think for brands, anyone who's launching a business right now, I think um, given the changes in the world, you mentioned COVID, um, I think that really proved the power of like a community oriented uh, brand. Um, and we certainly felt like, you know, our users, we know people have like made friends with each other and like made in-person meetups based off the community. I was really inspired by what Instant Pot did with their Facebook group strategy um, as well. So yeah, I'd say that's our, our brand has become more and more. Um, it's not necessarily about my story. It's not what we chose it to be. It's more about we're a platform for the community. Let's spotlight the people and the amazing things that they make. Let's share more and more of our um, user generated content and things people tag and make that our social media because it's not about us. It's about them. Um, so that's, that's really how the brand has taken shape over time. Yeah. And again, I, I really think it's a cool concept. Cause I, I, again, I feel like you created a, a chemistry set an at home chemistry <laughs> set for folks, because the beauty of it is you can really truly go down different markets. Uh, like you mentioned, you can do team tricks, you can do drinks, you can do gummies, you can do all these different things and infuse them. And you can create your own brand from that, folks. Like you can you can go to the farmer's market and, you know, get some food certifications and create your own thing. Uh, or if you want to do oils, right, you can you go to any farmer's market and you're going to see that. And Levo just makes it a little bit easier to do that, which is really, really cool. Now, with that said, you know, you've been going through this entrepreneurship journey now uh, for almost a decade. You're getting there, right? Now, what <laughs> advice would you give for aspiring entrepreneurs? Um, I would say that 
um, talking to people in your life, like just be, make a really thoughtful decision before you get into it and, and really investigate how committed you are. Um, think about uh, if you were gonna get married to someone and the process that you'd go through to really make sure that's the right person and the right thing to do. Um, you know, think about your personal values, think about the vision that you have, talk to people around you, like let them challenge it, sleep on their feedback. Um, I would really spend some time. Um, I think that nine month consideration period for me, like was a really helpful time. Um, and I, I, I would say, question it, play devil's advocate with yourself. And then I'm a huge believer that if you go into something with the right reason and the right intention and with a real steadfast commitment to it, that you can make anything happen. So as long as that you take that right, that you take the right step and it wasn't impulsive and it wasn't rushed and it wasn't out from a place of stress, not a fear-based decision, nothing like that. If you can really say to yourself, I'm doing this for all these reasons with the best uh, you know, judgment that I have available to me right now, and I've slept on it and challenged it, then I, I think you're set up for success. I think that's one of the best ways you can set yourself up because it's all going to change. It's not going to go according to your plan. It's all going to get thrown out um, and you're going to be taken down a million routes. But if you can come back to that center, I think, and you just stick with it um, more and more, I think uh, it's about sticking with it. I think almost anyone can be really successful just sticking with it and then pivoting if you need to things like that so that, that'd be my main advice is being prepared yeah i, I completely agree and again i would encourage those folks to network the heck out of it um and, and get advice from folks in the industry you are pursuing um sometimes when we get advice from individuals we know it might have a bias to it right mom and grandma are always going to love your idea this is phenomenal right uh, <laughs> some of your buddies are going to rag on you no matter what you do no matter how sex successful you are just because they're your boys or your your, your girls right your friends uh so uh, making sure to get some advice from leaders within that market uh, individuals of all stages within that market is very, very encouraging uh, because you'll get a lot of great advice from people. People want to see you succeed as well, like like we were talking about. Uh, even within the you know the entrepreneurial ecosystem in your own little community, you'll be surprised to find a lot of different nonprofits that want to help and support the growth and scale of entrepreneurs. So you know, really, really take advantage of those opportunities. Now, if folks are interested in Levo, how can they find more information? How can they come contact you where can they find you on social media um thank you so much for that uh we'd love to have you even if you're never going to buy a levo we'd love to have you follow and comment um and join our community and learn about things um so there's a facebook group called the levo love club um that's mostly people who own the machine but there are some people who are in there considering it and talking to people um you could just search facebook for the levo love club uh, our website is levooil.com l-e-v-o-o-i-l.com and our instagram handle is at levo underscore oil um, and we'd love for you to follow um and uh and share perfect and again folks if you do not remember uh, any of this information this is a great time to plug the shades of entrepreneurship lose letter where you can subscribe at the shades of e.com we will have this information the week the the week before the episode airs the week the episode airs and the week the after the episode airs you can also follow us on social media at the shades of e on instagram facebook linkedin and tiktok uh we'll also air this interview on youtube so you can search at the shades of e or or the shades of entrepreneurship and you should be able to find our podcast and lastly i would encourage those if you would be so kind to join us on patreon for as little as five dollars a month you can join the uh, the podcast patreon page to help support the podcast which can, again continues to bring you educational insights from entrepreneurs like one today again Levo Oil, I I would highly recommend checking it out. Uh, to be honest with you, I hope my wife is not listening to this episode because I think <laughs> the Mother's Day gift I'm going to provide to her, uh, just because she's she's big into the the kitchen area. She really loves you know uh, working on different things and kind of putting things together. And her for some reason her ability to put ingredients together is just phenomenal. I, it's, it's it really does crack me up. She's one of those people like, oh, I think I'm going to just make ranch because we don't have it. And she'll whip out some ranch dressing. That's like, awesome. Just make ranch. It's crazy. <laughs> but yes, it's great. So is there any last words you'd like to say to the audience before we leave? Um, thank you so much for having me and uh, get after it. Go get it.
Get after it. I love it. Christina Bellman, thank you so much from Levo Oil. Uh, again, folks, uh, if you want to follow Levo Oil on social media, and you can also subscribe to the newsletter, and we'll have all this information for you. Thank you, and have a great night.